I got a school this morning, so I don't have to stay. This thing is high enough to look at everything in front. That's good. Perfect I chose this subject of the value of church attendance because um, every congregation has a problem with human beings that sometimes do not come to the assembly or they forsake their signal. Do I need to put this on? It would. It would. It's already on too, isn't it? Oh, okay. Yes. It's <laughs> on. church attendance needs to be preached on from time to time because we do have brethren that sometimes because of weakness and may not be mature as they should be in the Lord, may not be as strong as they should be, sometimes don't see the need to want to attend all the service. Now you brother here may not have that problem, but I'm telling you, uh, we as human beings sometimes do for say uh, do come to church as we should sometimes. So a subject, a subject like this is never old. It is something that needs to be repeated over and over to the young people, the next generation, and encourage the ones who do come to the assembly to always want to attend this thing. So I thought that something like this would be a very, very important one. And so I'd like to have your attention concerning this lesson, and I hope that um, you will learn some things and pick up a few pointers that can help us. First of all, let me read the text from the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. I'm reading it from this English study file, I use it all the time in my study. And this fellow does a pretty good job of breaking down text. And I just want you to hear what this translation says concerning Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, 24 and 25. Again, this is an English standard translation. It says, let us consider one another to provoke to love and good works, not forsaking our assembling as is the habit with some. So that let us know that some were not attending worship services or the assembly, they were not doing it. He goes on to say, but encouraging one another, and so much more as to see a day drawing near. So there are reasons why we do attend worship services. And for those that don't attend, they need to recognize that it may be wrong that what they're doing, it may be assembly, breaking God's law, or they may not have never thought about it, but we need to notice the importance of it. So let's notice some things here on this subject. But so we're looking at the value again of church attendance. And I put Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 because we see in that text, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it's a wonderful text. I think it's a, it's a wonderful text to look at. So let's turn to Acts 2 42 and see what Luke wrote here for us in this text. Acts chapter 2 and verses 42. The New Testament church had just come into existence. Um, there were about 3,000 that were added to the Lord's church that day. And this is the first time you see the word church mentioned in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says, And praising God, well I'm just going to read verse 47, Praising God and having faith with the Lord, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' preaching of teaching, and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. So they continue to assemble and come together as members of the Lord's church. So there's a great value in faithfully attending and worshiping God. But as I mentioned on this chart, sadly there are some that don't see the need and want to do it. So let's notice a few things here. Some Christians even yield. Um, the one way you can um, show God your faithfulness and how much you love Him and your brethren is to always make sure you come to the assembly. But some Christians yield to the temptations of making a habit out of not a sin. And they see no importance in it. They see no reason to want to do it. But some brethren are weak and may not see the importance again. But we want to encourage them to notice the value of doing this. So let's notice some other things here. Notice in the first century, they probably didn't have all the things we have going on in the world today. We have better, te we have better technology. We have all kinds of things that they didn't have back then. But the first century Christians, many of them, had to overcome all kinds of problems that we don't have to deal with today. The Romans, um, meeting in hiding places and things like that, but the brethren did come together to worship God. 
They had to deal with all kinds of problems. And many today still deal with certain problems, dealing with a why they don't attend sometimes. Some because they're working too hard. It may be some because they're working can't attend. Some because they're sick or ill. And they may not be able to come out. But I'm talking about those that can come but refuse to come. That's the ones I'm referring to here in this lesson. So we need to understand the importance of this. So let's notice something there, so I'm going to get to my main points here. And so I ask the question here, when brethren say things like, do I have to go to church service? Do I have to go Wednesday night? Do I have to go Sunday morning or Sunday evening? Y'all meet on the Sunday morning here. But do I have to do it? That lets you know something about their heart. It lets you know, let you know something about their love for God if they have to do that. Now, I can understand them saying, do I have to go to work Monday? Because well, they might not want to go. But they know they're going to go because they're going to have to make money to pay bills. So that's not a problem. But they can still gripe about it all they want to. A brethren in the Lord's church that love the Lord and love brethren, they don't want to gripe about, do I have to go to a gospel meeting? What should I attend? Why is it important that I go in the first place? You know, those kind of questions cause you to think about their heart condition. Are they really truthfully um, in love with the Lord and love righteousness? And so when brethren start asking those kind of questions, I believe they might have a spiritual problem. And like I said, you brethren may not have it here, but you may have. But there are a lot of brethren, local congregations and Lord's people that do have this problem sometimes. So we just ask that question again. Why should we go to church? What is the value in attending worship service? Is church attendance essential to our salvation? That's a good question. I believe the answer is yes, according to what we read in the scripture. We just read Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. And I believe that text lets us know we must assemble. We have to come together to take the Lord's Supper, and we have to come together to give on the first day of the week. So there must be a assembly of God's people under a tree, in a building, in a really building. They must come together. Because we're commanded to do that when it comes to the first day of the week, the Lord's Supper, and of course giving. So how can we be sure that church attendance is valuable? Let's notice some things very quick. We can be sure because it's, it's simply God requires it. He requires us coming together to worship and come together as an assembly, as a group of people to serve the Lord. It's not man's um, um, problem or man's suggestions or what man thinks. It's what God says. The church is God's idea. It's not what man thinks. We're doing it because God commands us to do it. It was in God's eternal purpose. You know, the church was in God's eternal purpose before he created this world, according to Hebrews, the um, book of Ephesians, chapter 3, and if you'd like to turn your can, some of you are probably familiar with this text, read it many times, but it was already in God's mind. That shows us the importance of the church right there, that God thought it something special, even before he created this world. Look at verse number 10. <clears throat> Ephesians, chapter 3, and verse number 10 says, let me get it here on the King James translation here, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold, the many phrases of God's wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Notice that text lets us know that this was in God's mind before the world ever came into existence. So it's very important to God, and it should be important to us. God believed the church, the assembly, which involved attendance, was valuable, and still is valuable. He thought of enough of us to put it in his plans. So we need to recognize the importance. I'm going to start showing you some points here as soon as I get through this. This is kind of like giving you a few little thoughts, some things to think about. But think, think for this for a second. If God thought we needed to meet together in the church, who are members of the body of Christ, all of us, to argue with him and tell him, I don't see the need to go to worship service. There's no reason why I should go. We don't have a right to do it. And like I read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, uh, 24 and 25. But notice verse 25, because I'm going to break that verse down a little bit. In verse 25, the writer says that we should not neglect meeting together. Then he pointed out, the terrible consequences of not meeting together. Deliberately just turning from God, or deliberately just sinning against God. It is a sin. 
In case you're wondering, is it a sin to forsake the assembly of myself together? Yes, it is. Is it a sin not to love your brethren? Is it a sin not to forgive? Yes. Same way when it comes to the attendance uh, as well on the church service. Let's notice. Now, I'll use this for example. Let's imagine the school in which the students could come to school as often as they feel like going. Or imagine an army in which half of the soldiers were AWOL. And I was in the military. We have some veterans in here this morning. Most of the time, the army could not function if that happened. A school couldn't function if that happened. So when it comes to the Lord's church, the same thing can happen. We need to realize the importance of being at the assembly. And God wants us to know that. And since the Lord wants us to assemble on the first day of the week, assemble when we come together for Bible class, gospel meetings, and things like this, we should be more than happy to do it. And I tell you the truth, some of you brethren here love coming to service. I notice that some of you brethren come early. I don't see that that often. You don't see that in the Lord's church much, that brethren show up 20 minutes early. That's a wonderful thing to see. That's very encouraging to me. But there are some congregations that preachers are only one at the building. I've been in I've preached in places. I'm talking about a gospel meeting. When we met on a Sunday morning for Bible class, it was just me and my wife and the preacher. And no one else showed up until 30, 40 minutes later. And I'm the visiting preacher for the gospel meeting. And they want me to come preach for them. And no one showed up for the Bible class. And you think I'm going to let it get away? I didn't. I preached on it. <laughs> I want them to know, look, I traveled all this distance. Y'all please come to service. I don't know if they liked it or not, but I had to let them know about it, though, you know. But what he asked us to do, it's not difficult, brother. It's not difficult to make it a sin. Let's think about the heart problem. If you really love the Lord from the heart, I'm talking about really love him to keep his commandments. It's not difficult for us to assemble together with people we love. Well, as I said earlier, with some brethren in here, because 1 John 5, 3 says that his commandments are not burdensome. We can keep them if we want to. They're not too hard for us if we love the Lord. And then let's notice how we're coming together is radical for us because it requires certain things. God requires them. Now let's look at some things I want to mention here. Why church attendance is valuable. Let's mention some reasons why. I believe, first of all, that we are helped when we come to services, church services. I'm encouraged when I come to worship service. Are you encouraged? I'm built up from the lessons in the Bible classes. I'm built up from the sermons that are preached in the worship service. Uh, when you go to a gospel meeting, I'm built up. I'm encouraged. So it really helps when you attend services. Another thing is the assembly helps us to keep proper respect of the life. Not only that, the assembly helps us grow spiritually. When a brother or sister is not attending, they're not growing. I guarantee you, most of them are not reading their Bibles or studying their Bibles in their home. Because if they did, they would come and they would run into Hebrews 10 and 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. So I don't get a lot of brothers are reading when they do that. They're just not coming to the assembly. But we need to recognize the importance. Spiritual growth is essential. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So how do I grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? By searching the scriptures. When we come together for Bible classes, when we come together for singing, we learn through singing too. We learn from gospel meaning and from these other wonderful things that we do. And we are told in 1 Peter 2.2 2, to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If you desire God's word, you're going to be at the assembly. We ought to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 um, and verse 15. And then Acts chapter 20 tells us that God's word builds us up. You want to know what builds us up and makes us strong in the Lord? It's the word of God. Notice Acts chapter 20, when Paul was getting ready to lead the elders, that after he was leading these elders, he was weeping when he left them. He told them several things that are very important. But one thing he mentioned in verse 32, or Luke recorded, it says, And now, brethren, I commit or entrust or commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build, edify, build you up, and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So what does God's word do? This verse tells us right here what it does. And when you forsake the assembly, you don't get a chance to, uh, to learn God's word or to experience what God's word could do by not being at the assembly. So these are some of the reasons why it's very important. 
And since we study the scriptures, when we meet together, that is coming together like we are this morning, everyone should want to be at their center so we all can grow. Do you remember Matthew 5, 6, the Sermon on the Mount? <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount started with Matthew 5 and it goes through Matthew chapter 7. But we just want to notice Matthew 5 and verse number 6. And there's something in that verse that really that is important that should encourage us in assembling together when we come together to study God's word. Look at verse number 6 and I'll just read it here. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed or happy are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If I hunger and thirst after righteousness, that is, after God's word, I'm going to be glad to be at the assembly to hear God's word taught. Where all the other brethren are being edified. That's the point behind Matthew 5 and verse number 6. And then notice also Bible classes, gospel meetings. All of these things can encourage us. And why should we come to them? Because we grow. Some of you may pick up some things in the lessons that I taught that you might have probably never heard before. Or some of you may have never studied before. And then some of you all are familiar with them. But it's good to hear them over and over and over again. Because God's word is never going to change. If you live the next 50 years, this word is not going to change. It's going to do the same thing it's doing now. It's not going to change. And it's always to encourage us. So let's look at another reason why here. The assembly is help to overcome temptation. When you come to the assembly, you are encouraged to overcome temptation. You get the nourishment and the food that you need to help you overcome. Without it, you might be, you might give in to temptation. This is just one of those things that God coming to the sinner to do. We get strength to overcome temptation from prayer, being with the brethren, to encourage one another, through the songs we sing, like yield not to temptation. Uh, when we meet together, we pray for ourselves and for others. We pray also while we are the sinner for brethren, don't we? You ever seen the sinner with brethren didn't pray? They always pray, even in gospel meetings, they pray. Even when you have a Bible home study in someone's home, they pray there. So that's encouraging to keep us from yielding to temptation, giving us the strength we need from God's Word. We also overcome temptation by studying God's Word. I don't have my Old Testament, um, New Testament, which will be out in bring it, but Psalm 111 tells us that God's Word, when you're studying God's Word, you're not so easy to give in to sin when you're studying the Word there. God's Word keeps us from sin, it really does. I wrote in my Bible here, and I, I wrote it because I always wanted to remember this. And uh, this is something I heard, and when you hear me say it, you're going to say, oh, I heard that before. Um, and if I can find it real quick. What it is, is, is you ever heard of the saying that uh, an apple a day, what does it say, keep the doctor away or something like that? Well, don't you know a scripture a day will keep sin away from you? It will. So I got this in mind. Sin will keep you from this book, the Bible. But this book, the Bible, will keep you from sin. And I wrote that because I want to always read that when I need encouragement. So you study the scripture, will help you overcome temptation. It really will. To overcome those things. And when we meet together, we study the scriptures together and we pray. And this is why when you miss the Bible class, if you're missing out on something, oh, that's still just a sorry about that. You're missing out on something that's very important. It was good to Make sure we have 10 to I mean, church people. Notice some other thing here. Here's another one. The assembly helps us to overcome, become like God. Excuse me. You want to be godly? Be like God? Don't forsake the assembly. When we come together, like we read right here in John 8.34. You know what John 8.34 says? Some of you might be familiar. I'm going to read it. This is just one reason why we attend the assembly. We become like God in our worship. When we worship God, we we stay away from sin. We bear. We don't um, give in to sin. We're not servants of sin anymore. That's what he said in John 8, 34. We're not servants of sin. We don't belong to the devil. We belong to God. So this is one of the reasons why you don't want to forsake the assembly. Jesus answered them, Very, very truly, truly, I say unto you, Whosoever commit a sin is a servant of sin. So when we become more like God, we stay away from sin. We grow in his grace and knowledge. We um, desire to do things that are righteous rather than things that are not righteous. Now look at 1 John 3, 8, because I'm going to put it there. There was a reason for it. 1 John chapter 3, and verse number 8, this is carefully at this. 
I like what the writer says here in this verse. Notice he says, he that committeth sin, that is, he that continues a life of sin, continue just practicing sin, is of the devil. Sure he is. He's not of God. Then it says, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's the purpose right there. So we want to serve God. We don't want to serve the devil. Then you end up being a child of the devil. So the assembly helps us to become more like God and godly living and doing the things of God. Notice when we really give ourselves to God, we take the characteristics of God. What are some of the characteristics? Well, there will be a lot of them. We can think like Christ thinks, being humble, not lift up with pride, remembering others in our prayers, uh, forgiving those that do us wrong. When they ask us to forgive them, we forgive them. These are some of the things. Uh, continue to study God's word every day. These are some of the things that we need to walk in the footsteps of Christ. And that's what, he, that's what I mean by when I say the characteristics of God. I'm referring to those things that, like being holy, like God is holy. 1 Peter 1, 16, God is holy, we need to be holy. You know, God forgives, we need to forgive. Um, when those people turn from their wrongs and they ask forgiveness. These are just some of the things I'm referring to. Let's notice, so we notice the assembly helps us become more like God. And then there's another one that we need to notice. The assembly helps prepare us for heaven. When you forsake the assembly of God, how do you expect to get to heaven? Now, here's something that people don't think about. If you can't stand in the assembly for an hour, where does they stand? If you can't sit or be at the assembly for just one hour, what in the world makes you think that you're going to want to serve God for eternity? If you can't do it that long. Because some brothers say, I heard a brother tell me, oh, you've got a certain time you need to be through, Brother Caldwell. Now, what I preach at right now, I preach only 35 minutes every Sunday. And I be watching the clock. Because there's a couple of brothers in there that be saying, you know, yeah, now you, you kind of going over there. Now, you tell them Paul preached at, preached at midnight. They'll say, well, that was Paul. That's not true. <laughs> so, <laughs> they really don't care, really. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes I go over sometimes. So here, I really feel good because you brother don't have no time limit on me preaching. So, and I try to get through in a good time. So I do that. But I know of what people, you know, things that people think about and what they want to do and all. So I'm always doing that. But if I can't stand to read God's word here, I can't stand to, to sing, sing to him and all these other things, you're going to have a hard time in heaven. As a matter of fact, you're not even going to make it. You know, wonder about you're going to have a hard time. You're not going to make it. See, you need to love to be at the assembly. That's the attitude God wants us to have. If I can't stand to worship God in Bible class, I'll worship for a few hours a week. How am I going to worship God in heaven, like I said, for eternity? It's going to be very difficult to do that. In heaven, we'll be singing to God, praising Him, giving thanks to God, serving Him for eternity. Not just when you every once in a while. This is for eternity. And so being at the assembly prepares us for this. Worship is a preparation for heaven. Now yeah, let's notice another one here. So it's getting us ready to be with God eternally. Then we can encourage one another through being at the assembly. You know that? Suppose half of you brethren didn't come back at 11 o'clock. You just went home and went coming back here. I'm sure some of you brethren here would be discouraged knowing that the brother that sits next to me, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, is not here this morning. And boy, I sure wish they were here. I'm so encouraged by this brother and sister. Well, we encourage one another when we come to the assembly. We do. We encourage one another through songs, through teaching, through just talking to one another, encouraging one another. And I see that you brother have some huggers in here. You know, one brother I stayed with in, um, I was, uh, it was in West Virginia. It was in Par outside of Parkersburg, West Virginia. This brother, every morning, he'll fish something for his wife that passed. So every morning he'll fish food and he'll, I sit at the table with him. Then he'll reach out and grab my hand. I wasn't used to a man holding my hand. He'll hold my hand. I said, well, I'm not used to this brother. <laughs> and then he'll pray for me and pray for me. You know? And I wasn't used to this. And this brother's real loving. And then he had a brother that hugged me. Then I had a brother that certain places I preached at where they weren't encouraging at all. I reached out my hand to a few brothers in certain places. But they wouldn't shake my hand. They'll keep their hand in their pocket. That's, that's not encouraging. So what I do, I grab the brother. 
Look, you don't like it, I'm going to grab it. It'll make it even more bad. <laughs> yeah, don't do that to me, so you better get me to shake my hand. Don't draw it back like you're reaching for something. Sometimes I see the brother shake my hand, they say, then they'll put their hand back in the pocket. That don't look good either, do it? <laughs> yeah, so I've seen that before. But uh, you got to know how to handle it. When you mat reach towards maturity, you know how to handle those little problems. You know, you don't get angry and upset. But it's a shame when you see things like that. Church attendance is very valuable because it provides us with the opportunity to encourage others. Now, Hebrews 10 25 said that. Look at verse 24. Matter of fact, this is one of the reasons why we assemble. Look at it again now. Let's look at it and see what it says in that 24th verse. It says, Let us, and Paul used let us several times in this chapter. You can see it in verse 22, verse 23. Let us, let us. Let us consider one another. See it? To provoke to what? Love, agape love, and good works. See? And you do it by not forsaking the assembly of yourself together. We encourage one another. We stimulate one another by doing this. It's what he's telling us. Then let us notice also our attendance helps us. Uh, it helps other Christians who may come to church services not feeling good. They may have a bad day. Uh, someone pulled in front of them and threw the finger at them or something, called them some names or whatever. Uh, something else happened while they were on their way. They got in an argument or something. Well, coming through the doors and coming to the assembly, we can go up to those brothers and say, oh, how you doing, brother? Good to see you, brother. And lift up their spirits by encouraging them. So our attendance help other Christians when we come together. And I'm glad we attend church service not only to praise God, as we do, and to grow spiritually, as we should, but also to help brothers and sisters in Christ, encouraging them. So we can see some values of being at the assembly. Singing, because we, we are edify one another through singing by the words we sing. And then let's notice something else here. Confessing our sins. Don't you brother here when you have brother that want the church to pray for them, they'll say, brother, since I've done this, I've done this, I repent of it, I ask you, brother, to pray for me. When we confess our faults one to another, pray one for another. James 5, 16 tells us to do that. I use Acts chapter 8 because the uh, sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer, he wanted to purchase the Holy Spirit with money. That was a no-no. So Peter told him, your money and you are going to perish. So he was told to repent, and he did repent, and he was told to pray. So that's what God's word teaches us to do. We come to the assembly to do that with one another. And then what happens when there is no togetherness? Well, many members are, and they are absent. Well, you see a, a service that is not um, growing as it should, not being edified as it should. And so I use this example. Suppose we build, uh, suppose a fire happened in this building. You know, uh, uh, it happens anywhere. You know, one way I found out. And now, you know, when you look at this, I'm just going to read the way I have it because I'm trying to, I don't want to get it confused. Suppose we build a fire, but after a while, scatter the coals. If you scatter the coals, you know they're going to get cold by themselves, right? But as long as the coals are together, they're going to stay hot, right? If you have brethren forsaking the assembly of themselves together, you're going to find a weak attendance. You're going to find brethren not as strong as they should. You're going to find brethren following the examples of other brethren and say, well, he wasn't here today. I don't have to go either. But when you put those coals together collectively, they keep the heat going to keep the fire going. That's why we need each other as members of the body of Christ when we assemble. We encourage one, one another when we assemble together. It's very important. And then our church attendance helps us to help those who are not members of the church. Suppose you bring a visitor with you. Only one brother showed up, but the congregation has a hundred. But only one showed up. And then several visitors come. They don't see anyone in here. That's not encouraging either. So we have people that are non-Christians as well as those who are members who are visiting from out of town when they see attendance. You know, all that happens. We attend regularly. We say Christ is important. We tell people that. He's important to me. My job comes. It's very important. But God comes first. I'm going to trust in Him. And God will take care of everything else. This scripture right here, Matthew 5, the verse you need to notice is verse number 14 when it says, I'll let your light so shine. Um, before those in the world. Because we glorify God through our good works. And so when we assemble together, we can help encourage or, um, or teach or show people how important worship service is to us. By letting our light so shine before those that are in the world. And then we, if we fail to attend, 
We say Christ doesn't mean anything to us. Maybe that's what some brethren are doing. I'd rather go out washing my car. I'd rather cut my grass this Sunday than show up for worship service. I don't want to be at the Bible class. I don't want to be at the service. Then when they do come, they come in late. And so they want to stir someone else. They really don't care. But Christ says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. And you can see in Acts 2.42 that they meant more than them just on Sunday. You can see that in verse 46 and 47. But 46, rather. 42, they came together to take the Lord's Supper. They had to assemble somewhere. And when they forsake the assembly, they're not there. And so we need to recognize the importance of that. Church attendance um, lets us be, uh, recommend Christ and this church to our friends. Are you ashamed to tell people that you're a member of the Church of Christ? Are you brethren ashamed to do that? Because we've got brethren in the body of Christ. They'll talk about everything except the Lord's Church. And when someone asks them, what member of the church you are, I'm a member of the um, Church of Christ. What? <laughs> church of Christ. You know, they don't want to mention it. They're afraid to let people know I'm a member of the body of Christ. There's no reason to be ashamed of that, but some are. Because sometimes they don't want to upset their friends. Lose their friendship. Well, if you lose your friendship for Christ, then Christ is more important to you. And I'll tell you all, for one of you brethren, let me know when I'm supposed to finish, because I might not remember. So one of you brethren, wave your hand, and I, I know what that means. Don't scratch your head, because I'll stop right now, so <laughs> let me know when it's time, okay? <laughs> now, why is church attending the value? Let's look at a few more reasons here. Well, we can worship God together, right? Take the Lord's Supper, give on the first day of the week. Same praise to God. Teaching the Bible classes, right? And um, uh, also help win souls to Christ by that. So that's very important. And so worship is important. Church attendance is very important because it provides us with the opportunity to worship, which we do, commanded to do. Worship in turn satisfies man's longing and pleases God. It does. And not only that, but man is worshiping. Uh, worshiping preacher. God made us like that. You're wondering sometimes why you have that desire. What man have a desire to want to worship something? They might worship a rock or tree a wood or something, but they're going to worship something. They might worship themselves or worship some other man, but they're going to worship something. But our worship should be to God. That's where it should be, God. God is in spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's John chapter 4 and verse number 24. Now, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, I read that because I think this is important, so I read this one. Revelation chapter 4, and verse 11. God made us like this. Yeah. Notice what it says in Revelation 4 11. It, start, it starts off by saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God created us for a reason. Now go back to John 4 24 because there's something that I left off that I need to go back. And I need to read for you. And I should have read verse number 23. I did. I quoted verse 24. Verse 23 is important. Listen at verse 23. John chapter 4 and verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. Watch this. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God wants us to worship him. So when we come to the assembly, we can worship him and do it the way he wants it done. And then let's notice, God always sought men to worship him. That's the point I was making. And you can see those same two texts right there. And to worship God, um, we worship God through saying, prayer, studying the word, taking communion, yes. Giving on the first day of the week. We do not worship to please men. We worship to please God. That's why we don't have instruments of music in here this morning. Because we worship to please men. We could have instruments of music in here, but music would make worship go so much better, as they say. But we know God's word doesn't command us to do that, so we don't have that. So we're not worshiping to please men. We're worshiping to please God. Don't be surprised when you travel now, even in the... Uh, the God in the Truth or some of these other magazines where they show you all the churches you can attend, you have to be careful when you attend those services out of town because sometimes um, you might go in a congregation that have now an instrument of music in the worship. You ever done that before? I know people that have went to attend services in other parts of the state 
And when they went to the assembly, they didn't know they were going to bring out instruments. They brought instruments out and set them on the stage, start playing instruments. Or they had a woman giving the announcements. And so we have to be careful about that now when we travel. But that happens. We don't want to please men, we want to please God. So do we truly worship God when we come to church services? So what are we thinking about right now since we looked at these points so far? Well, let's move on to something else here. Let me um, mention something that's concerning this subject. Let's talk about what attitude should be or uh, we should have towards church service. We looked at the value and importance. Let's talk about the attitudes coming to the assembly. Some ask, do I have to go to church service, which I discussed already. But that kind of attitude misses the whole point of the assembly together. Because the whole point of the assembly is to edify, build up, encourage. God wants us to meet together, not to place us on the burden, not to make us feel uncomfortable, not to do things that benefit us, but benefit Him. He wants us to come and worship Him. I don't worship the person next to me. I worship God. Let's look at some other things. You ought to consider the assembly. Not as a necessary evil. It's not evil to come to the assembly. But as an opportunity to praise God, God of heaven, and to serve Him, and to help and encourage others. I know I said that over and over again, but you need to repeat it so that the young people get the word and get the message because they need to know why they come to the assembly. And so these lessons never get old. If you start asking these kind of questions, do I have to go to church? You know, notice this right quick. Matthew 6, 33. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. But Matthew 6, 33, now when the time for the worship service has come, how do we look at that text? How do we really at all study that text or understand what that text is saying? Kingdom there is ruler and authority, of course, but we do come together as an assembly, and the word church is used sometimes interchangeably in the Bible. It's used to refer to heaven, like in 2 Peter chapter 3. It's used to refer to uh, brethren coming together as a group, ecclesia, and then sometimes it's used to refer to the rule of God, authority of God. That's how it's used in Matthew 6, 3. So when we say, when it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, of course it's talking about God's rule and his righteousness, but it's also telling us how we should love brethren in the body of Christ to come to the assembly, be here at the services. All that falls under that text. And then let's notice Titus 3. Well, what does it say? I need to read it. Titus chapter 3, verse number 1. You know, Paul sent Titus on that small island of Crete to set things in order. And when you look at Titus chapter 3 and verse number 1, here's what he wrote to him. In that first verse. He said, put them in mind to be subject unto principalities, that's rulers, by the way, rulers. Be submissive to rulers and authorities of powers to obey rulers or magistrates. He said to be ready to every good work. Every Christian should be ready for every good work. Assembling on the first day of the week, assembling for the Bible class through the middle of the week, assembling for the gospel meetings, that is a good work. It's a good work. And that's why I use Titus 3. Ephesians 5, 16, we are not making the most of our time correctly. We don't assemble. We're not using it wisely. And we're not worshiping God as he tells us. I talked about that last night. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. We ought to love God with all of our heart, soul, being, as that text says. That's what we ought to do. But we do not do that when we are not assembling on the first day of the week or assembling whenever the church comes together to do it. We're not showing God that we love Him more than anything else. And then Romans 12, 1, we ought to make a little, live a living sacrifice or we ought to offer living sacrifices. And that is deliberately, that's something God wants us to do when we meet together. Yeah. But some brothers don't see the importance of doing that. So they forsake the assembly and they miss the assembly. And it's very important. First Corinthians 15, 58. We are always to be abounding in the Lord's work. When we attend <coughs> church service, how can you do it when you only come together once a week? Or one time in a month? Or sometimes every six months? Or a whole year? You have some brothers you don't see them for months. Then you have to go visit them. Find out why they're not coming. When they tell you I'm not coming back anymore and all, then you have to give them the brethren. They got to get together, discuss what they're going to do. 
Because if this brother tells them he ain't coming back to the assembly no more, he don't want to serve God no more, then we're going to talk about withdrawing from the brother. But we need to make every effort we can to try to get him or her to repent and come back to the Lord. But then if they don't, if it doesn't work, we're going to have to withdraw. We're going to, matter of fact, when I get back, we already wrote a letter to one brother uh, that needs to repent. He won't do it, so we're going to have to withdraw from him. We don't make every effort we can. And if they don't want to obey God, you know what the text says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 6. Now, this is my, my, my lesson this morning. I'm just throwing this in for free. <laughs> um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, listen at this, verse 6. Because, um, and I use this as example, it says, listen at what Paul says now. Now we, are comm we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say the name of Paul, he said the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by his authority. That you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly. What is disorderly? That means walking out of ranks. And when I was in the military, um, you know how they call Goma Powell and all. I guess I was a Goma Powell. I was bigger than everybody, and they called me Goma Powell. Because I had trouble trying to learn simple things like left, right, left, right. I'd be going right, left, right, left. <laughs> so they pulled me out and stopped marching with me by myself until I learned how to do it. What I was doing, brethren, was I was walking out of ranks with the rest of the fellas. So they had to pull me aside. That's what it means when it says, withdraw from brethren that walk disorderly. They're not walking according to the commandments of God. So what do we need to do? We need to withdraw from them. That's what God's word teaches us to do. And we don't withdraw from them with hate. We love them. We're doing it only to help them come back and come to their senses and repent and come back to the Lord. And I seen brother who withdrew from come back to the Lord after they repented. It works. We need to do it the way God said. But in this text right here, it says we are always abounding in the Lord's work when we attend church service. Not only once in a while, but all the time that we can make every assembly. Sometimes you can't make it. Sometimes you might be sick. You might be out of town. You may not be able to make it. I think that's understandable, but I'm talking about people who just deliberately just don't want to show up. So what kind of Christian would deliberately miss their assembly? Yeah, that's the kind that God doesn't want. Yeah. Then you need to notice if one has the right attitude, church attendance is valuable because it makes him feel, well, does church attendance make you feel good when you come to the assembly? Are you joyful when you come to the assembly? This is not the primary purpose of worship, by the way. We don't come here just to feel good, but if you want to feel good, you can get some instrumental music to make you feel good. But the Bible classes should make you rejoice and be happy about attending, about learning and growing. We should always be happy about that. That's the purpose. Worship is, worship is intended, intended to please, it's intended to please God, by the way. Whether or not it makes us feel good, it doesn't matter. We need to do it because we love the Lord and we want to please him. But when a person has the wrong attitude, they're not going to do it that way. And so we have to do the way God wants us. You can do a lot of things by saying you feel good about it, but you're not really into it, what you're doing. You see? And that's my point behind that. And let's notice something else here. Suppose worship does not make you feel good. <laughs> what you need to do is a new attitude. You need to gain a new attitude. You need to change your heart and have the right kind of attitude. Love God. Love being with the brethren. And you're, you're happy about being in the assembly. Let's move on. I have a couple things I want to hear. You know, worship is not something that you grow, you know, just dream up and it just happens. It takes skill, it takes time to learn how to worship God. When a person becomes a new baby in Christ, they may not know much of anything. They're going to have to grow and learn as they continue to grow. So, worship is a learned skill. You learn every day about how God wants you to do things. We must practice before we can learn to love it. You're going to have to. <coughs> As you grow, you, have, you realize the importance of church attendance, the importance of repentance, the importance of teaching the lost the gospel of Christ. You know, you learn all these things once you start growing. And that's the point behind this. And let's notice this here. Now, this is something I want to get to right here. There are some problems which do happen, arise sometimes when people fail to attend as they should. Let's just notice something here real quick. Number one, I want to mention this one. We tell people that church service is not important. If your next door neighbor, you tell them I'm a member of the Church of Christ, I love the Lord, 
Um, I worship God. I, God want me to worship Him. But this person see you out there cutting your grass on Sunday morning, doing something again Sunday evening, doing something on Wednesday night. This person's going to ask, stop wondering, did this person really love the Lord like he said he would? He don't even go to church. So we tell the world that attendance is necessary, but we tell it it's unnecessary when we don't attend. That's one of the sad things. We let them know that it's not important at all. The Lord never planned any unnecessary items. Anything God does, He does it the way He wants to do it, and it's a plan behind it. He planned for us to assemble. He wants us to assemble. And we can see it in Hebrews 10, 25. God gave certain ordinances that ought to be observed in the assembly. So attending is very important. Let's just notice some of these I put down here on this chart. I remember. Now the tender says to the world that obeying God is not important. That's what we tell people. Whether they tell us that or not, that's what we're telling them. We glorify God in the church assemblies when we sin, but we'll tell them that we don't glorify Him if we don't go. And God tells us to attend, so if we willfully miss, we are willfully disobedient to God. There's no way you can get around it. I heard arguments on it, I heard debates on this. Every time that they use everything they can on Hebrews 10, 25, to try to get out of it. Man is the one that makes the time for us to come together on Wednesday night. God's word didn't say anything about attending on Wednesday night. You ever heard that argument before? Some brothers say, where's the scripture authority for attending on Wednesday night? You show me where it says Wednesday night. And I start going. <laughs> and so I tell them, I'll take them back to Hebrews 10, 25. <laughs> I say, why did we choose Wednesday night for Bible class? Um, to come together to study together? Is that for sitting or assembly that's skipping or not skipping or is that showing you don't want to be there or be there? Is it important to go? Yes, it's important to go. Because some brothers do argue they say Wednesday night is something we made up. Well, who made up the times on Sunday morning, Sunday evening? The congregations, didn't it? Local congregations, brother, set the time. Now you know there brother around here meet at 7.30 on Wednesday night. And I told that sister last night, I said, you're going to have to repent, lady. <laughs> I was joking with her, of course. Let's get that right. I was just teasing her. They meet 7.30. We don't. We meet at 7 o'clock. That, that's, that's what we call a scriptural time for church praying. <laughs> so if you don't show up that time, you're in trouble. Okay? But I understood what she was saying. You brother only meet, what, two times here on Sunday for Sunday. And some brother out of state, like in Arkansas, they say, oh, no brother. They're they way out there on the limb. <laughs> They're not doing anything wrong. It's up to the local congregation autonomous to make their own decisions what time they want to meet, what time they want to come together. No one has the right to tell anybody to do that. We just need to meet for the first day of the week to take the Lord's Supper and to give them the first day of the week. You need to make sure we do that. But at the time is up for the local congregation make their own decisions about that. You bring them to meet 5 o'clock on Sunday evening. You can do it if you want to because that's, that's autonomous. That's for you to make that decision on here. But some brethren don't understand and they think wrong, but uh, it's nothing wrong with that at all. But non attendance says to the world that you know, obeying God is not important. We glorify God in church assemblies, as I mentioned earlier. God says to attend. If we willfully miss, then we are disobedient. We show that we love God less than we love the world. Whenever we put things in the place of assembly together, like I'm going out hunting on Wednesday. Or Sunday morning. I'll be back Sunday night. Now you think of that. I'm going to be there Sunday night, but I'm going hunting Sunday morning. And I just have to skip worship Sunday morning. See, that attitude is not right for a person who's seeking God's kingdom first, who wants to please the Lord. You may come back Sunday night, but it's the attitude behind it. I don't think I need to be there Sunday morning. See what I mean? So that's what we have to think about. We become a source of discouragement to those who attend with faithfully. Is that right? I believe that brethren are discouraged when they see that others are not here. When they know they can be here or probably they're not here, I believe it comes a little discouragement to them. I knew that happened to me on several occasions. Our attendance declares that we have little or no real interest in the progress of the church, the worship, you know, worshiping God, edifying us, edification of the saints. Uh, some brothers don't see the importance of it. But the great cause behind this earth, I believe, it's simply that brother need to realize how important it is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And once you get that in your heart, you'll understand the importance of being at your assembly and how important it is. Let's look at the here. When brother don't come back to worship services on Sunday night, 
It always hurts me. I put this down because I use it when we preach it. Because we, you know, the summer tennis have like, you, you'll see the bigger tennis Sunday morning. It might be like 150, 200. But then on Sunday night, only 25. Then you say to yourself, what happened to the other 100 and something? Did they all go on vacation? Did they all go to work? What happened? Well, that's what happens with some congregations. And on Wednesday night shows it too. You might have um, 100 on Sunday morning and 100 on Sunday evening. That's wonderful. But then, you know, on Wednesday night, you might only have 20. And you kind of wonder, what happened to everybody? Well, it does discourage you when things like that happen. You can't do anything about it. You can encourage them, but you can't. Because empty pews really speak loud. They really do. When you see an empty pew, it lets you know a lot. It speaks loud. An empty wagon makes the loudest noise. You know that's true. And so let's think about that for a second. Now here's another reason here. We tell the world that our failure to attend, by failure to attend school, that we do not want to go to heaven. I'm telling you right now, we're going to be serving God for eternity. I'm talking about eternity, not a, not a few years, but eternity. And so the world, you know, play, it, now let me tell you what the world thinks of us when they see people miss their sermon. I wrote this down because this was something on my mind. The world thinks of a tenor as being heaven bound. And non-attenders are not thought of as heaven bound. That's, what, that's how the people see us in the world. And they say, this person must not want to go to heaven. He never goes to church. See, that's the way they think. It might not be right, but that's how they think. So non-attenders are not thought of as faithful um, people to the, denominate, to the denomination of the world and to those in the world. So when we willfully absent, us, absent ourselves from assembly, we give the world cause to doubt us. We don't want to do that because we want to be an example. We want to win them to Christ. We want to be a light to them. So we have to be careful how we live and care ourselves. And we have to be careful about the assembly. The world, you know, affects us by our non attendance They're affected by it. We are, they are. They don't think we are spiritual. I mentioned that. They don't. They may think that other things like family, friends, jobs, or whatever come before God. They may think that too. These things are more important. When a Christian don't show up for work, and my little neighbor says he's a follower of Christ, he's a Christian. He never goes anywhere. He goes hunting, goes and everything else, never goes to church. And they look at that. We don't think the people of the world are watching us, but they're looking at us. I like Philippians 2.15. I'm going to just read that. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 15. Listen at this text right here. See what it says. Philippians 2 and 15. It, it really makes sense when you read it. When you compare it to Matthew chapter 5. And notice, it says, <clears throat> That they may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Now watch this part right here. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. That means that we are living before them. And they can see our light whether it's shining or not. They can notice it. And so we need to be very careful how we care ourselves as Christians. Then let's notice, we tell the world that we think we can be saved on our own works. Because I don't need to go to church. And that's not going to save anybody. We say by our actions. I don't need to attend. I don't need to worship. I can do just as well by myself or being all by myself. I don't need to go anywhere. I'm okay. Well, then you're following your own works then. Not God's works, but your works. We cannot save ourselves. We can't. We only do God's righteousness, yes. But I'm talking about saving yourself outside of God. No one can save themselves outside of God. If Christ going to die on that cross, we're going to have nothing in this world today. Nothing to live for, we've been doomed. So you can't save yourself in a manner of, I don't need God. I don't need his word. I don't need to do this or do that. And that's the point I'm making when, we, when I write, we tell the world that we think we are, can be saved by our works. So my words say, I don't have to go. What did it say, Matthew 7, 21? I quoted it earlier, I'll do it again. Not anyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's the one that God is pleased with. Notice, doing God's will, not our own works. 
but doing God's will. That's what saves us. Luke 19.10, why did Jesus come here? To seek and to save the lost. So we need to obey him because he came to save us. Romans 5 tells us we couldn't save ourselves. So Christ had to die for us because we couldn't save ourselves. Man didn't have the strength, he couldn't do it. So it took the death of Christ to do that for us. And these are just some of the things just to let us know how that we need him. We're saved by grace, but it's God's grace, God's mercy shown to us. We're not saved by ourselves. We can't save ourselves by obeying the gospel, by responding to it. But I'm talking about doing it the other way, but outside of that. There's no way you're going to be saved doing it that way. And that's Philippians 2.12, that's another church. We say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But I think that's the correct text. If it's not, let me look very quick. I don't want to misquote that text here this morning. But on this Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 12, I think that's the quotation there. Let's see here. I always tell the brethren that if I miss the, miss the text, just read the whole chapter, you'll run into it then. It's in there, <laughs> run into it, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it says, well, for my um, beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. Of course, you're going to have to do God's will to do that to please God. And I hope these points are not boring to you. I hope they're edifying. I, I appreciate you all listening carefully at these things because even though these lessons have been taught hundreds of years and never get old, we tell the world, I'm in Christ. It's not important when you forsake the assembly. He died to bring the gospel of the church into existence. According to Acts 20, shed his own precious blood. We honor Christ by obedience, which includes assembly with the saints. See? So you honor him by doing this. When you don't, you don't honor him according to the text. And then let's look at this point here. When, when we willfully miss the assemblies, we miss certain important matters. Let's talk about those important matters very quickly. Well, if we miss the assembly, we miss eating the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul taught them the correct way to take the Lord's Supper and the purpose of the Lord's Supper. He explained that to them in those verses. When they come together on the first day of the week, they to eat the bread, which represents the body of Christ, and they drink the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Christ. Paul explained that to those brethren. Acts 27, they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. And not breaking bread is not eating a common meal. It was taking the Lord's Supper. That's what that was. A threefold reason is given to attend and eat the Lord's Supper. Now, you know, now y'all will learn one thing from me. When I get on something real simple, I try to make it as simple as I can so no one can misunderstand me. So a threefold reason is given to attend and eat the Lord's Supper. Here we are. First of all, we are commanded to do so. We have examples of brethren in the first century doing so. And then number three, a penalty is given for not eating the Lord's Supper or taking it on the first day of the week. Right from that text that we looked at, a few of those texts that I just called out. <clears throat> so these are very important. And then let's notice this. There's 1 Corinthians 11, right there, I mentioned earlier. In case you didn't get it, there it is again. Put it down again so it can be seen. There's another one. If we willfully miss the assembly, we miss singing praises to God. Well, we are coming, we come together to sing praises to God. We're commanded to sing. You can see that in Ephesians 5.19. It's a privilege to sing. It's a blessing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a beneficial thing to sing. Praise to God. It is for our own good to attend the sing. It gives us encouragement and strength. How many of you ever been um, so like, I hate to say low spirit, but low spirit because of something happened in your family, someone died, some of your friends um, are sick or something happened in your family, something like that. And when you come to assembly, believe it or not, those songs that we sang out those songs, those pick up your spirit. They really do. <coughs> that shows us the importance of coming together to sing, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. Colossians uh, 3.16, those two text right there, all you need. Now, one of them tells us that we are edified through the same. Let's notice, that's Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. We are edified, I believe that's the one in Colossians 3.16, one of them. Is, I'm just going to read Ephesians right now. 5.19, see what it says, speaking? That word speaking means talking or telling or uttering words. So, speaking to yourselves, 
in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's what it said in that text. Then Colossians 3.16, which is the next text that we use, there are nine scriptures that we use um, dealing with singing. And so we try to show that to the world so they want to, um, and if we ask them to show us the scripture, we can use instruments of music, which they can't do. But we can show them these. Let me read this one here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another how in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I'm going to sound like Ephesians 19. So singing builds up and it edifies us. <coughs> Hebrews 3.15, with the fruit of the lips. That's what that text says. And let's notice this. If we willfully miss the assembly of ourselves together, we miss praying with the saints. You want the brother to pray for you? One way you can do it by not forsaking the assembly. Come to the assembly, you can ask prayers of the brother. They'll be more than willing to pray for you. Because prayer is essential. It's influential. I mean, it's something that you need to do. We encourage one another to do it. In James 5, 16, it says, but confess your false words to another. Pray for one another. It says, you effect your firm and firm. The righteous man availeth much. You heard that last part? The effectual, permanent prayer of a righteous man develops much. You know what that means? That means that prayer is powerful. That's what, that's, that's what it's saying. Prayer is powerful. It is. That's why we talk to God. That's why we ask God, if I'm moving, Lord, help me find a better job. If I'm doing this, help me with this. Help me with that. We tell those things to God. We ask God for those things. That's what God tells us to do in prayer. Prayer is a powerful weapon, and when you don't pray, you're missing out on a lot. That's our communication with God, through prayer. Of course, you have to be righteous and faithful if you want your prayer heard, because that's what we read in 1 Peter 3, and I think it's verse um, 12, 1 Peter 3, 12. We need to be righteous, faithful. But these texts right here just lets us know how the importance of prayer. I put down Philippians 1, 4, Acts 2, 42, they prayed on the first day of the week, Took the Lord's Supper, all that was done in Acts 2.42. And then when we, um, and I put the here, the prayer is a vital part of our faithfulness in both private and public. Praying when you're by yourself, praying with the assembly, or praying among brethren. Same thing. It's very important. First Timothy 2.8 tells us to pray for not only ourselves, but pray for the government. And we need to be concerned about others. Don't be a selfish person. Uh, prayer. You know, we have some like that. They don't what they do. They just pray about, uh, pray to God, God about themselves. Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me. <laughs> well, we ought to remember others when we pray. You notice when brother lead prayer in here, they pray for everybody. That's the way God wants it done. You need to pray for everybody. There's a time you pray for yourself, but there's a time to pray for others as well. Notice it says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter two and verse number eight here. I will therefore that men, that's andros is the Greek word, if I pronounce it correctly, andros, that means men only. I will therefore that men only pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Now this is dealing with the public assembly, by the way. That's why Paul wrote this first Timothy. It's dealing with the public assembly. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. That don't mean your hands have to be holy. That means that you're living a righteous life, that's spiritual, you're pure, pure. It says, without anger or wrath and doubting. Doubting here doesn't mean like you're doubting when you pray. It just means quarreling or it means argument or disputing. You don't need to do that. Okay, five minutes. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm sure we're going to cut short on this sermon. <laughs> well, I hope you got out of something that we're talking about. Luke 18, 1 says we are always pray and not faint. And y'all know First Thessalonians 5, 21. Pray without ceasing. So that, these are some of the important things about the assembly. If we willfully miss the assembly, we miss giving on the first day of the week. We are commanded to do that, 1 Corinthians 16. We are told how to do it with the right attitude. I talked about that last night, cheerfully, not grudgingly, or necessity. We saw that last night. And um, I'll skip that, it's not important there. Let me go to some of that one. Just a couple of things I just want to mention in this last three or four minutes. Other things to think about, when I miss church services, I'm going to disclose this after this. I am not going to be ready, watching and waiting for the Lord's return if I don't see the importance of a similar brother. Matthew chapter 24 tells us that we should be ready, looking for the Lord's return. And 
I'm telling you, when you're not coming to the assembly, you're not really looking for his return at all. You're not hoping it comes either. But that's something we should all keep in mind. Attending every service contributes to our preparation, being ready for the Lord's second coming. Because we thank a lot of being with the assembly of brothers. That's what we thank. And then how can I have a clear conscience? Can I have a clear conscience? How can a person have a clear conscience when they do something like that? They really can. Because you don't know um, you don't understand the importance of the church service and why we do it and why it's important to come. So I hope that some of these things we talked about, this, this here, by the way, was a free uh, two-sudden sermon, by the way. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> so I'm just giving y'all some of the main points here, but I'm going to get ready to close here. The local church is dependent upon this member. Is that true or false? I'm just showing you some of the main points. A church is not stronger than the collective strength of the members. Is that true? They all show up together. It makes a difference. My wife said, why don't you use this for the second part of the sermon? I said, oh, I got another sermon. <laughs> I'm never close, I don't want to hold him until long. What my absence did, it made some question, question my reality, question whether I believe in God. It made some think that I wasn't a pretender. It made some think that I was regarded by my spiritual welfare as a matter of small concern. It weakens the effects of the worship services. These are some of the things that missing the assembly do. A lot of wonderful things in this lesson. Hope you got some on, on the important ones. It discourages the brethren. It causes others to say, stay away from their church. It made it harder for me to meet the temptations of the devil. It encourages the habit of non-church going brethren. So I hope that this helps you, brethren. I hope it encourages you to want to be at all the assemblies, understanding that God commands us to do it. We've got to meet somewhere because you can't have an assembly uh, for taking the Lord's Supper and giving if you don't assemble. So you've got to assemble. And you don't need to forsake it when you do, when we do come together. So I hope you God encourage you that. I appreciate God and the time that you let me have to encourage you in this. Like I said, you may not have that problem here. Everyone that comes this morning may be here, I mean, at 11, on Wednesday night. That's good. But all churches need this lesson because not all of them do that.